Father, we thank you, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, today, church, we start part five of our You Got Served series. Uh, you Got Served is really about helping you learn um, how to release your gift through love to meet the needs of the church and the community around you. Here at ECV, we are also behind the scenes developing a network within the church that allows for us to become aware of the needs of the church and the community with the goal of serving others to meet those needs and release your spiritual gift. The title of today's message is the ministry of joy. The ministry of joy. We've been journeying through Romans uh, chapter 12 and we continue that today. Romans 12, 15, a very simple verse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We're going to say it together as a church. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, let's venture back in time if we can. I want you to think about a moment, your best moments in your life, these monumental moments in your life. And I want you to think about how it made you feel when the individuals that you loved the most and those in whom were closest to you were present in that moment. How did it make you feel? Anybody, throw it out there. How did it make you feel? Loved. That's it, that's, that's all we got, huh? You know, Mike, how did it make you feel? At peace. Pastor John, how did it make you feel? Joyful. Mike, how did it make you feel? Important, so I knew you would say something like that. No, I'm just messing with you. Now, I want you to think about those moments. And I want you to ask yourself, was anybody missing? Was anybody missing from some of those moments? And if so, why did you want them there? Why did you want them there? And some of the most celebrated moments of your life, there's obviously some times where people just can't make it. Why did you want them there? Well, I can only assume that you knew that they were going to bring an investment, a deposit, a deposit of joy to celebrate with you. You, you know how it is when you get close relatives and friends, you do goofy things. When they come around, when it's a celebratory moment, some of you guys get your feet going, some of you guys have a handshake, some of you have a dance, whatever it may be but you want them there. And you want them there because in those moments they get to share something in your life that doesn't happen too often. See, what Paul is talking about is of great importance to us in 2019. He's talking about a spiritual deposit through the emotional means of joy and pain. Joy and pain. Joy and pain. Sunshine and rain. See, that's it. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I couldn't help myself. I couldn't. And I knew somebody else was thinking it. Exactly. We were on the wavelength. So I had to get it going. Joy and pain. But this is also about a transformed life through a renewed mind discerning the will of God as we express genuine love to others. I'm going to keep talking about how this whole thing is just connected. 
all right? The genuine love of others. In other words, what Paul is saying is, how do we actually express our love for others? How do we show that we even care about other people? But this also assumes that you know that you are servants of the Most High. And as servants, ministers. Ministers. In the Bible, the words servant and minister are the same thing. Diakoneo in the Greek. The same word we get the word from what? Deacon. Servant. Minister. So that means that Mike, you're a minister. That means that Anya, you are a minister. Jen, you are a minister. It is not divorced from servitude. This is about the power of presence. The power of presence. Your physical presence incarnating the love of Jesus Christ. See, our You Got Served campaign isn't just about developing a network to serve one another and reach our community. But it's about helping you to understand that ministry is life. Ministry is not a church event. Ministry is not just a church program. Ministry is life. Wherever it is that we go, we're looking to serve. We do not divorce who we are based on where we work. You don't divorce it. When we minister, we are entering the lives of others. But we must know how to enter the lives of others if we're ever going to serve one another and reach the nations. We've got to learn how to enter into the lives of others. And Paul shows us two ways to enter the lives of others as we develop our personal ministry in Christ. However, this week, um, I'll be unpacking just one. One way to enter the lives of others is by celebrating their victories with them. Amen. Celebrating their victories with them. I'm going to stay right here. Stay there. <laughs> stay there. Stay right there. Don't move outside of those black lines. Rejoicing is the act of esteeming others higher than yourself by showing, Tiago, that you are delighted with their good news. That you're delighted with their good news. Stephen, it goes further than just saying, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy. It goes much further than that. Paul specifically directs the act of joy towards who? Those who rejoice. That means, folks, that there is an awareness of your joyful moment. There's awareness. But what Paul is laying out is a key principle that husbands and wives know too well. How am I supposed to know if I don't know? Husbands, can I get an amen? amen. How am I supposed to know if I don't no, we do not have sixth sense. We do not have telekinesis. I can't tell by your eyebrows and I cannot tell by your words. Mars, Venus, we do not understand one another. And so sometimes as husbands, we are held hostage to what it is that we actually have never been given the information to. And so sometimes even in ministry, you have people get upset with you about things that you don't even know. That's what Paul is saying. How am I supposed to know how to be joyous 
and celebratory for you if you never say anything about it. How are people ever going to hear? Now I know what you're thinking. I know where the battle lies. It's in boasting, isn't it? Some of us struggle with the difference between boasting and testifying unto the Lord. We struggle with that. I don't want to take too much time, but briefly, I just want to state for you one thing. I understand you. It is our battle. Because you don't want to get up and begin to share, and then all of a sudden it begins to look as if you're bragging. It's because you have not discerned your audience. I would assume that a homeless man under the bridge isn't going to be joyous for the CEO who gets a million dollar bonus. I just don't think they'll, he'll have any joy with that. You got to know your audience. Mm. All I'm asking is for you to identify in that moment who you're lifting up. Who you're lifting up. Now some of you, you just have the gift of gab. And there's just TMI all the time. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about that. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about that. Ask yourself why you're saying those things. Ask yourself. I, I'm, I don't know your reason. All I'm saying is, is that if you see that the people aren't joyous with you after every joyous moment, you've got to begin to think about the audience. And we've got to think about whom I'm exalting. Am I exalting just my personal achievements over individuals who have lost their jobs? Or am I discerning the moment? I don't think this would be the right time to say anything. See, I've got some, some joy partners here and outside this church, and you should have some too. Individuals whom I know I can share some information where they're not going to look at me funny when I share it. Because I know there's real joy and they understand the situation. What's happened nowadays is that some of us don't know how to testify unto the Lord. And I pray that you develop that. I pray that you develop how it is that you testify about the Lord in situations of great achievement and accomplishment. Amen? Amen. But it's about awareness, isn't it? How can I have joy if I don't even know? Well, in Luke chapter 1, verse 57 through 58, we're given the account of Elizabeth's uh, time of pregnancy and bearing the son, John. Luke chapter 1, 57 through 58, but pay attention to something. Everybody say awareness. awareness. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives, what? Heard. Heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And they joined in and rejoiced with her. They heard about it and they didn't stay still nor silent. They excitedly rushed to support her for God had shown her great mercy by opening up her womb and blessing her with a son. It was amazing because though the neighbors weren't experiencing their own miracle at that time, it allowed for them not to be hindered in their ability to rejoice with Elizabeth. Elizabeth did the same thing a couple of verses before with Mary, didn't she? She rejoiced and she didn't say, man, I've got John the forerunner. You've got Jesus. Oh, blessed be you. No, she rejoiced. She rejoiced. She wasn't in a position to where her and was just like, oh, get out of my house. No. In the same way, the neighbors, they weren't hindered in their ability to rejoice with Elizabeth because they weren't just thinking about themselves. But every time we read and study and look to apply, it's something I shared I believe with Elder Josh and Brother Donovan 
I said, when we're looking at the word of God, I said, it completes us. And so there's an incompletion. And when we look at this, I think anybody who isn't of Christ could look at this and say, well, I rejoice with others who rejoice. But the Bible's calling us to do something that is that without the Holy Spirit, we can't accomplish as well. We are called to rejoice with those who rejoice, even if it's something you've never accomplished or something that you've always wanted. We've got to rejoice. You didn't go to college, but they did. Your business failed, but theirs was successful. And once again, it's not about just saying, oh, I'm so happy for you. It's about going further in. Early church father, uh, John Chrysostom, uh, writes, Rejoicing requires a very noble soul so as not only to keep from envying, but even to feel pleasure with the person who is in esteem. It is indeed more difficult to congratulate others on their success, especially if their success involves disappointment to us than it is to sympathize with their sorrow and their loss. It is only when self is dead that we can take as much joy in the success of others as in our own. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read here verses 11 through 32, and I'm just going to spend the remainder of our time in this unit. And this unit comes after Jesus responding uh, to the Pharisees who said in verse 2, this man receives sinners and eats with them. But we're going to go through the parable of the prodigal son. And I want us just to Observe this in just in some different ways. Verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I know what I'll do. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring, hey, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. End of story. No. Verse 25. Now his older brother or I'm sorry, now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the party. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come. And your father's killed the fattened calf. Because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look. These many years I've served you, 
and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, or came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? You can tell his older brother, that's what he had his eyes on, that fattened calf. And he said to him, son, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We've read through this countless times. I just read it from a different perspective this week. I wanted to be the brother's lawyer. Doesn't the older brother have a very valid point? Let me help make his argument. Doesn't it seem that he's been treated unfairly? He was in the field working. Come on now, he found out about the party. <laughs> Through one of the servants that was probably getting stuff, and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and there's a party going on. For who? Your brother. But we got to get this calf we about to eat. Doesn't it seem that he's been treated unfairly? Doesn't he deserve a celebration for his years of obedience? And shouldn't he be able to celebrate it with his friends? Doesn't he deserve a reward for his loyalty? Come on now. I'm making a defense for the older brother. But there's an error in his judgment. He worshipped the triune God of this world. Me, myself, and I. He worshipped the triune God of this world. Me, myself, and I. When self is the object of your worship, you will be stricken with spiritual blindness. Blind to the accomplishments of others. Unable to be refreshed by the victories of others. You can't even drink of that cup. It cripples your ability to enter the lives of others and rejoice with them or even weep with them. He pridefully compared himself with his brother. And if we pay attention to what he said, he wouldn't even give him the designation of brother. He said, your son. What does that say? That we're not even on the same page. I'm here. You're there. He pridefully compared himself to his brother. Prideful comparison leads to jealousy, envy, bitterness, and hatred. Prideful comparison leads to selfishness, not selflessness. But church, you have got to be a secure individual to rejoice with others who rejoice. You got to be a secure individual individual I know what you're thinking maybe and I said I wouldn't have six cents now I'm claiming that we do there's nothing wrong God gave you emotions with experiencing letdown there's nothing wrong with that cry when you need to cry hurt when you need to hurt there's nothing wrong with experience let down when you're competing with someone for a job or a position. However, to harbor bitterness is sinful and should be dealt with immediately. Look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be what? 
put away from you along with all malice. Now look at the contrast here. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Can you see what the bitterness is blocking you from? The ability to be kind to one another. The ability to be tender-hearted and forgive one another if we are harboring bitterness, malice, and all those other uh, characteristics that align more so with Satan than with our Savior. Truth be told, Let's take this even a step further. Your bitterness is really not towards the person. It's towards Christ. Amen. It's towards Christ. You may argue with me and say, no, it's with the person, it's the position, da 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 You're angry about how God's plan has unfolded before your eyes and it wasn't in your favor. And it wasn't in your favor. And you're actually upset with Christ but you lie in your private moments with God that it, like it had nothing to do with him. But you're angry of how it unfolded because, now let's go a little step deeper now. Because you find yourself either in that moment doubting or believing in the sovereignty of God because what you're saying is God made a mistake I was supposed to get that position I was supposed to marry that person it was no me but Lord I love you We're upset with Christ on how the plans have unfolded for us. We're upset at it. But we don't want to go that deep to consider our vertical relationship disturbing our horizontal relationship with people. It's always connected. I am a recovering sore loser. Recovering. All right? That means I'm still in rehab, right? I know Javon's looking at me. Um, I was going to show a video today, but I was like, I, I wasn't going to do it. I have a, you know, there's a, there's a competitive streak that has, you know, really become under wraps. You know, as we were praying about, you know, spiritual uh, matters, as Elder Josh was sharing this morning in prayers, like maybe that I should have brought, you know, some of that up, the self-control, you know, aspect of as well as I was praying uh, with Mike, but I was a sore Loser. Why? Because it wasn't working out the way that I planned it. But when I win, I want you to celebrate with me. There's nothing wrong with that, right? I'm still in rehab. Help me out. I remember Brother Javon, Donovan, back then we were in high school. They would come over to the house, bring Corey, Nick, you know, and I would run through the house playing video games. You know, and in my humility, I would record their reactions. You know, and believe me, when they beat me, no one ever would find out if they beat me. I was a sore loser. I didn't want to shake hands after a game ever. If I lost, what? <laughs> why do I want to come and celebrate that you just beat me down? That didn't make any sense to me at all. No, I'm not going to shake hands. I'm going right to the locker room. You don't want to shake hands with me. What would I tell you? I'm in rehab. This even uh, began to uh, rub my church people the wrong way. Remember, as an associate pastor, I was in a basketball league in Scottsdale, Jewish Community Center. Pastor John remembers that. We were terrible. We were severely out of shape. Repenting, I think, after every game because of we felt that we did not show the excellence of the Lord out there on the court in our stamina, condition, or skill. So we would come to the church staff meetings and every week they would bag on me. 
man, why are you guys still playing in this league? You guys are really looking bad for us as a church, right? We were in last place, and we end up winning the championship. Exactly. So, what had happened was, we got on a hot streak, and I recruited one player. And he happened to make a difference in what we were doing. But we beat a team that had won like eight or nine years in a row, and they had like college players on their team. So after the game, um, they treated me the same way that I treated them. I would never shake their hands, ever. But now that I've won, I'm going through that line with pride. You know, smile on my face, you know, hey, thank you. And so, um, you know, guys didn't want to shake my hand. They shook everybody else's hand, but they didn't shake my hand. Right? It's because I couldn't stand to watch someone else accomplish something that I worked so hard for. Couldn't stand it. Maybe you're like me. Some of you have worked so hard in the positions that you're in, the career paths that you're on, the jobs that you sacrifice the majority of your week for, and you're just watching people pass you up all the time. Little by little, it begins to plant some bitterness. Little by little. May I speak to the barren mothers of how many have tried over the years to have children and just couldn't. Only to see all your friends and family members labor and enjoy the birth of the child. And how you used to get tired of people coming to you saying, hey, do you don't you guys want to have kids? Or the single female or male at home it's extremely difficult to watch others find that significant other. The Bible says for us to rejoice. I understand. I understand. Or those opportunities that you work so hard for to get in front of somebody and someone who is less qualified end up getting the position. Oh, God hit me with a tough one. I worked extremely hard to get into the NFL. <sighs> extremely hard. If you know my work ethic, just take that you know, to uh, my athletic profession. And I want to tell you where, when it hit me in the gut one day. I wouldn't say that the Lord audibly spoke to me. But I definitely felt his leaning upon me. And he says, instead of getting to the NFL, you're going to help others get there while you watch them walk in. You're going to spend the good majority of your life helping people to get somewhere that you couldn't go with joy. With joy. It happens in ministry. It's what holds ministries back. When you see that someone else is up and coming and you stifle their growth by not even giving them opportunities. I've been in ministries like that. Pastor John, you've been in ministries like that. This is tough. But once again, like I said, now you understand. Your problem wasn't with that person. The problem was how God's plan unfolded. When we are focused upon our perceived injustices, we actually hold grace and mercy hostage as if they were not freely given to us 
to give away to others. We hold it hostage. Now let's get back. The older brother was mistaken. He was mistaken. This was not a celebration based on years of service or obedience. This was a celebration of life. It was a welcome home party because his brother was as good as dead and he is alive. He was lost and now he is found. It doesn't mean that the father loved the older son any less. All it meant is that they had different priorities. They had different priorities. I believe that if it would have been a celebration for service, loyalty, and obedience, definitely his older brother would have been there. But it wasn't that type of party. Church, <clears throat> break the unhealthy tendency to challenge the charity of God. Who are you to dig in the pockets of God and tell him how to spend his grace? I don't want my hands in God's pockets. I don't. Break the tendency to challenge the charity of God towards others. Who are we to direct anyone's affairs when it comes down to their charity? Daniel, who am I to reach into your pockets and tell you how to spend your money? But yet, we assume a different relationship with God and we have a problem with his charity like he's never given you anything. But there's also something else within this that really speaks to uh, a, even a better modern uh, application. Is that the father is not celebrating irresponsibility. He is not celebrating immorality. And he is not celebrating immaturity. Irresponsibility, immaturity, and immorality. And we should never celebrate those things either. Ever. I'm not celebrating your immaturity. I'm not celebrating your irresponsibility. And I am not celebrating your immorality. Allow this to help you to discern how to rejoice with others. And be like the Father. And be honest. Identify why you're celebrating with the individual. So that they're not fooled into thinking that we're just celebrating because you squandered everything. No. He was very clear in identifying why he was celebrating. Let me show you how this looks. I had a friend of mine. And we were talking about his um, entrepreneur ways and ministry. And I told him, I said, look, we've been friends for a long time. And I said, you've never come to church once. I said, in 10 years, you've never come. And I, said, and I told him, I said, I'm offended by that. You can say it to your friends sometimes. Not really. Anyway, I said, I'm offended by that. He said, why? I said, man, I said, that's, I said, that's just telling me you don't support me. That's all. He said, well, Will, I don't go to church. I said, really? You ain't going to church for church? I said, you just going to church, man, just to say you support me, man. That's all. He was like, I never really looked at it that way. Now, there's another truth to that. You know, the word of God doesn't return void. So, um, of course, I want him to be here. But I said, look, if you were to open up a bar, I said, I'd be there to celebrate your entrepreneurship. And I'd leave early. I said, but I'm not there to celebrate that you're passing out alcohol to individuals. Identify it. 
Identify. Share with them. Because you've got family members that are, are doing things that you may not be in agreement with. I'm not saying, you know, what I am saying is just be discerning in those moments to identify and clearly understand so that you are not enabling more irresponsibility, more immaturity, or more immorality. Does that make sense? The Father, he's celebrating repentance, redemption, and restoration. These moments are sanctifying acts of the Spirit. This is, church, the will of God in our lives to rejoice with those who rejoice. And I challenge you to enter the lives of others by celebrating their victories as if they were your victories because this is what Jesus does. Let's turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 24. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 24. The 72 returned with what? Joy. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven, verse 21. In the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by, the, by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Verse 23, then turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus had given the 72 disciples power and authority to cast out demons, to heal and to preach the word. And they were not only successful, but they were faithful and they were excited to share their experience. Everybody say joy. joy. But Jesus adjusted their perspective by readjusting their purpose. That the real joy is their names are written in heaven. Then Jesus rejoices. See, that Greek word can also mean exaltation. And we can envision Christ demonstrating joy. Because he understood that the greatest joy is still the salvation of the lost. Jesus expressed his own joy. And as the Holman commentary says, a joy caused by the Father's work and inspired by the Spirit's revelation, for God is the source of all joy. For when we submit ourselves to the will of God, we are submitting ourselves to the redemptive service of Christ and the reward, everybody say reward, of pleasing Him. Jesus is celebrating the Father's revelation of Jesus to His disciples. It was a special moment that Jesus shared with them because the insignificant and overlooked were experiencing the revelation of Christ and participating in the victory. He ministered by entering their lives and celebrating the victory. As we seek to meet the needs of the saints and reach the nations, I implore you to develop your personal ministry of joy and overcome your own barriers of experiencing joy so that you may participate in the overflow. Let us pray.